We've got Gary Lineker, former England captain and broadcaster, sat right next to me here. Alongside him, we've got Maheta Malongo from the PFA, Sanjay Bandari from Kick It Out, Manchester United defender Aoife Mannion and Richard Ronker from Ofcom. So some really interesting stuff that we've all seen there and been able to digest as well. Was there anything that particularly surprised you, Gary? Yes, my inability to read a graph. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't think I was um, overly surprised. I think um, f from my own experience of, of, of watching replies to footballers um, over the years, I think the massive amount of tweets and obviously um, posts are pretty positive generally. Um, I think s most fans will probably be positive most of the time and then it's a very emotive game, football, and, and fans can get very upset and perhaps sometimes cross cross the line and get abusive and it, it's probably not that frequent. But there will be, and it's a very small percentage, but a very small percentage of 2.3 million tweets is, is still a lot of abuse, um, will be probably serial offenders. And, um, and that's obviously um, what we need to target and, and, and how we address this situation is, is obviously uh, there's a lot of food for thought in it, but it's very important to get the report in the first place so, so you can actually say this is a real thing, um, this is you know, a genuine problem. And I think um, the research into it is, uh, has to be welcomed and then, then we work out what to do about it. Yeah, I think as the researcher showed and Andy pointed out at the start as well is that there is a great deal of positivity on social media. The sad part is, is that even when you receive one negative message on social media. It can really affect your mood and your performance as well. And that's what we need to stop Aoife. So as a player in the women's game, despite the fact that we've seen an incredible last month of football in this country, which climaxed in Sunday's events, as a player yourself, do you choose to not use social media the same way that some of your friends who don't work in football do? Well, I think it's part of the human condition, isn't it? That if you get a thousand tweets, it's that one negative tweet that, that sort of hits the most. And I think there's a real visceral emotion that's attached to reading negative tweets. Um, and I was really interested to hear about how the AI machine learning um, experts were sort of quantifying and, and working out all the data on what constitutes positive, negative, critical, and abuse. And I think part of the problem is that as footballers, we're not actually always sure what is abuse. We know what negative is and we know what that feels like, but we're not always sure about when it crosses the line. Now, the most obvious reason and, and, and circumstance when it crosses the line, and I'm sure Sanjay Kick It Out will talk more about this, is when it's directed against a protected characteristic. So race, potentially more relevant for the women's game, gender. Um, but it was, it was super interesting for me personally to see the report because it gives the data and the language to the anecdotes and the stories that we as, as players um, feel. When I, when I was telling the girls today that I was going to do this, I, I said, oh, I'm going to be discussing a report delivered by the, the Alan Turing Institute. And you can imagine we, we didn't all know what that meant. And I said, oh, it's, it's going to be on a panel with Ofcom. And they didn't really know, all of them, exactly what that meant. But when I said it was about abuse, directed towards footballers, in this instance, professional um, Premier League footballers, everyone knew what that meant and everyone wanted to share their story. So for me, I'm really excited to be on this panel um, and listening to, to all of the insights that everyone's going to be sharing. Um, Meheta, in terms of the work that the PFA have been doing, does the research that the guys have presented to us today reflect similar research and findings that you've had with working with players as well? Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and I think the comment that you just made is very interesting in the sense of why is it the player's responsibility to do something about that? So it's like you playing for, in front of 40,000 people, someone abusing you and the ref blowing the whistle and saying, stop, you deal with this guy. No. Why is it you need to push the button saying, I don't want to see those comments. Why do I need to adapt the way that I interact in social media because I'm a player? I'm a human being. No? So I, I think what, what we're hearing is, is two things. Is one, you know, the players don't want to be in the role of the victim. You know, it shouldn't be them. They want to be known because of their skills, not because they were abused online. So there needs to be someone who can deal with that. And second, I think, is a question of having real-life consequences. 
I think this goes to the point that Andy was making in the beginning, which is, you know, what is the consequence of this feeling of impunity? I think this is the source of frustration. Why do we tolerate stuff online that wouldn't be tolerated on the street? And I think the work that we've done, I think, last year in terms of commissioning a report ourselves was there are ways to actually identify those people, meaning you can report them to the social platform, you can report them to the police, but equally you can link them to a club and then probably ban them from the stadium, which can be the toughest real-life consequence you can have for them, not to be able to see your club. These findings that we've seen today, as we know, are based on Twitter research, Sanjay, but are social media platforms across the board doing enough? Well, I think the, the data speaks for itself, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> whatever our stories are, when you see 2.3 million tweets and the volume of abuse, 70% of players experiencing abuse, um, you look at the, the number of, you know, in front of thousands and thousands of fans in an online crowd. So it's not just the fact that the players are abused, it's look at all the people who are witnessing it. And when we combine that data with other data that I've seen, transparency reports from other platforms, we did some of the re initial research with the PFA and, an, and another AI company a couple of years ago. You know, I, I did the, the sort of back of an envelope calculations, and when I combine that data, it is a piece of abuse every minute of every day, 365 days a year. And Gary, from a player and broadcaster perspective, with someone who has as big a following as you do, do you look at the notifications? Do you see what people are replying to you? Um, I don't, there are two columns, aren't they? There's notifications from all and sundry, and then there's notifications of people that I follow and blue tick holders. So sometimes I'll look at the blue tick holders and people I follow because I'll probably get notification. Um, I don't tend to look at the um, other column because A, there are thousands all the time, and, and B, um, you will see the odd abusive tweet in there. Um, and I've had that, um, obviously, there was no social media when I played. I often think to myself, what would I do now? Um, do you think you would have been on social media as a I, player? I think I probably would. I think, like most players, I think it's an important, um, and it's a lovely link between you and the fans that you could never have in my day. Um, but what would have happened in, in my day is, is I think I'd do exactly the same thing as I did then. When I played really well and scored a goal, I would buy all the newspapers the next day. <laughs> when, I, when I played badly, I never bought any. And I think I'd be exactly the same on social media. If I played poorly and had a bad game, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at all. But if I scored and played really well, I'd be all over it. Um, I think different people different, will deal with it in different ways. Some, pay, you know, some players will have, you know, be very sensitive, be fragile, have uh, mental health issues. And they have to think about what they do, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be their, their problem. And we, we, we've got to try and address this. Maheta, from the players that you speak to, does social media abuse ever come to a point with them where they actually think there's no point being on social media anymore? It's a very good question. <coughs> I, I think sometimes it's a question of, of explaining why are you in the social media in the first place? What are you trying to achieve, no? And I think once they understand that it's, it's a loudspeaker that, that enables you to convey a message without anyone asking a question, mm -hmm. and it's a tool to drive change, mm -hmm. then you tell them you wouldn't forcibly judge your performance based on what the fans think, because normally you're not as good as they claim you to be and you're not as, w as bad as they claim you to be. So apply the same reasoning to what happened in the social media. So use this as a way to convey your message when no one asks you a question mm -hmm. about what you want to talk about, but equally don't don't pay too much attention about, about what, it, what comes back. But I guess the main issue is not possibly you, but your, your, your environment. I mean, your family, your friends, th that's the problem. Hence the reason why they feel like someone needs to take care of this, irrespective of them actually actioning it. So it needs to be like someone needs to deal with it. And there are ways to do it. And there are ways to identify those people. Hence, why don't we do something about that? No? Yeah. How often are players coming to you, Sanjay? or other people in the media to talk about proactively abuse that they're receiving on social media platforms online? Yeah, I mean, we see it, probably Meta probably gets more from the players, but I suppose what we see is, is everyone else in football, because actually this, this abuse is for people, is experienced by people who play, watch and work in football. It, it isn't just the current players, it's former players, it's pundits, it's, uh, it's LGBT fan groups, it, you know, and actually 
there's lots of talk about free speech. Some people are intimidated off the platforms. We've seen, we talked about one before, you know, a high profile, high profile pundit just intimidated off the platform, doesn't want to be on there, doesn't want to be, because of the volume and the, not just the volume, it's the, the kind of violence of the abuse. Do you think, Aoife, from a player's perspective, that the more we're seeing abuse on social media, when it comes to crossing the line, we're actually seeing that filter into stadiums more or into actually day-to-day -day life when you come across people? Do you mean in the women's game or? Across the board, yeah. Yes, I do think that it, that it is a problem. I think with the increased visibility and, and exposure um, of football through these platforms, uh, obviously Gary mentioned that Twitter wasn't as much of a thing, wasn't as, as about when, when he was playing, um, but it does allow us to connect with fans and supporters in, in a way that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, particularly for women's football because the game isn't as well established. So it's kind of a deal with the devil in some ways. We, we do need it, we want it, because we want the exposure and the visibility that we get from it. We don't want the abuse. Um, and when you ask Gary about you know, what is the difference between negativity and abuse, two things came into my mind, two particular distinctions. And one was, uh, Gary kind of touched on it, sort of action orientated or performance orientated comments um, as opposed to you as a person. So you did a bad tackle feels very different to you are something. So, so that's one distinction. And then the other clear distinction, I'm not, not sure so much how this would be picked up in the data, is almost like a pylon effect from specific instances. So sometimes it's not so much the kind of dribs and the drabs of negative comments that you might see over the course of a week or two weeks. You know, on any given week, I might see a handful of gendered-based abusive comments. It's kind of one particular tweet or, or one particular event um, being a catalyst for abuse. 